Hello and welcome back to a new session from the teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness. Today we're going to talk about the conscience and the law of Moses. We are still in the first big chapter entitled The Human Conscience. So far we discussed about the origin of conscience in our first session and about the purpose and the effects of conscience in the second session. And today we're going to talk about the conscience and the law of Moses. And here we arrive to a major point that can change your relationship with God in a significant way if you understand this concept properly. The reason why God gave the law was to bring your conscience back to a proper place, to the way that God intended it to function, back to the standard of God. The law was an attempt to reset and recalibrate the conscience. This was the purpose of the law, namely the Ten Commandments that we know of so well. But religion has missed the point and has propagated the idea that the reason God said you shall not do this or that was because he wanted you to fulfill and obey all these commands in order for you to be right with him. But nobody can keep the law. Nobody has ever kept the law. That might be a radical statement to many. Some of you may still think that God gave the law to people so that they would keep it. But it's not true. You can never keep the law no matter how much you try. The law was not given for you to keep. The law was given to show you God's standard of morality and perfection. If you yield to it, instantly it will cause your conscience to start functioning right. It would calibrate and tune your internal moral monitoring system that we talked about last time. Imagine yourself for a moment as standing in quicksand and sinking and having everybody else around you in the same quicksand. If everybody is sinking at the same rate, most of those people will not most of those people will not notice it and the sinking rate will be relative because everybody compares themselves with others. However, if you have a pillar on solid grounds with markers on it, even though everybody is sinking at the same rate, you can look at that pole and realize, man, I'm sinking. This is getting serious. In this case, you have a fixed and immovable reference point. And the law with the Ten Commandments was, God, was God's immovable standard of right and wrong. And the reason God gave it was to reactivate our conscience and bring us back to where we would not have any more a dull, evil, and defiled conscience or a conscience that has been skewed by comparing ourselves with other people. The law was given to show us right and wrong and to condemn us. The law was not given to set you and me free, but to condemn us. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9, where it says this. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. The Ten Commandments were the only ones written and engraved in stones, as this is mentioned in verse 7 that we just read. Those Ten Commandments are called the ministry of death in verse 7 and the ministry of condemnation in verse 9. Can you believe that? In the New Testament, Jesus came to give us life and Satan came to give us death. John 10 verse 10 says this, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus made us free of condemnation, but the devil and our conscience continue to condemn us. The conscience is like a robot that knows only good and evil. The conscience knows only when you sinned, but it doesn't know about the higher wisdom and righteousness of God in Christ that has, have already removed those sins that the conscience is condemning you with. And Romans 8 verse 1 says this, 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus, who fulfilled all the law and whose life was in complete unison with the law, is not condemning you when you sin. Yet the law, we see that it condemns you and it has always been a ministry of condemnation. Jesus is not the one condemning you when you sin, but your conscience fueled by the law. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 says this, The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. This passage tells us that sin produces death and the strength of sin is the law. Now before I talk about sin and the law, I would like to explain a little bit what the sting of death mean. I personally didn't understand this expression for years and I'm sure that there are, there are other Christians that are listening to me even right now in the same situation. How does death sting people, including believers, through sin and what does that mean practically? When people sin, death itself stings them. It is similar to a scorpion sting, if you want, or to a venom dose in injection into their being. Once the sting happens, death begins to affect their personality, mind, thoughts, feelings, moods, and the physical body without them even realizing it. Because death's effects might not manifest immediately. How does death manifest in their lives? They will not lose their salvation if they are believers, but death will affect the quality of their life here on earth. Sin brings condemnation and guilt that paralyzes paralyze believers' ability to serve God and people with full joy and peace because their conscience is tainted by sin. They might begin to feel confused, depressed, discouraged, overwhelmed, or hopeless with no reason, and they will wonder why that happened. Also, they lose their peace, joy, and become weak in faith when it comes to facing various life situations. One reason is that death infiltrated their being through their sinful actions and it began to affect them negatively. Similarly, the physical body is slowly affected by death. Those believers might experience certain sicknesses all of a sudden, age faster, and even die prematurely. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were stung by death and from that moment on, death started to work in them. Although not all the effects of death were seen immediately, slowly every part of their being was affected by it until they finally died even physically. The rate of your sinning accelerates or slows down the manifestations of death in your life. That is one, re one reason why we as believers in Christ are interested in walking in holiness so that we would live longer, healthier, happier, and richer lives and fulfill the calling and the destiny that God has planned for us. Now let's come back to the second part of the verse that we just read earlier where it talked about sin and the law. The law didn't strengthen you in your battle against sin. It rather strengthened sin in his battle against you. How? Well, on one hand, the law raised the standard of right and wrong and increased the sensitivity of your conscience. On the other hand, because of your spirit's sinful nature inherited from Adam, when your dead spirit came in contact with a perfect and holy law, it caused you to fail every time. As a result, it created in you the consciousness of a failing sinner in need of God. That is how law strengthens sin. It gave you back both the conscience as well as a sinner consciousness. Now, consciousness is a little different from conscience. Consciousness is a mindset, a way of thinking or a framework of all the things that you are aware of in the present time. Consciousness answers the questions, what do you know? What are you aware of that influences your life's decisions? While conscience answers the question, what is right and what is wrong? This process of how sin was strengthened against you is explained uh, in detail in Romans, 5, uh, Romans 7 verse 5 this way. Let's read it together. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. In other words, the law revealed the sin and the principle of evil that was already present in people 
in you and me, producing a chemical-like manner reaction. Most Christians believe that God gave the law to help us. True, it did help us when, as a human race, we had skewed our conscience by comparing ourselves with other people and lowering our moral standards to a degraded state. In those instances, when God said, you shall not, your conscience was brought back to where it should have been and you became aware that you were a sinner to the core. That was a good thing that God intended through the law. But the downside of the law was that it also condemned you. It killed you, caused you shame and fear the same way it happened with Adam and Eve when they got the conscience in the first place, resulting in all these negative effects. Therefore, one, on one hand, it was necessary for God to give the law for the sake of the conscience. But on the other hand, through the law, your conscience began condemning you and it continues to condemn you today in a continuous way. The conscience never tells you anything encouraging. Have you noticed that? Neither praises you for something that you did well. If you did 99 things right and only one thing wrong, your conscience will only show you the one thing that you did wrong. It will never tell you you are doing well, you are doing better, you are getting closer. The conscience is there to condemn you and show you what is wrong. The conscience has all these negative effects, but in the new covenant, we have something much better than the conscience and a better way of dealing with morality, although the conscience is also something that we still need today. At this point, you might argue, if everything you are saying is true and we are living in the New Testament, Maybe we should remove the Ten Commandments from the courts and from all the public places because now we have a greater law, something better. Not really, because not everybody is a born-again believer in Christ. Not everybody is following the Spirit of God, including believers, but especially for people that don't know God. Their conscience is the only restraint that they have against total ungodliness. Let's read 1 Timothy 1 verses 8 to 9 where it says this. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. The law is good if it's used properly and in the right context. We need the law. We need to have this perfect standard of morality. But as for us Christians, we can cleanse our conscience and we can move beyond it to even a greater way of relating to God and people. Who is a righteous person? The born-again Christian. At the moment of salvation, Christians become the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us that. People that are not born again in Christ, they need to know the standard of right and wrong. What is godly and what is ungodly? In the New Testament, God didn't change the standard. He just fulfilled it through Jesus and has made us clean, not based on our adherence, adherence to the law, but based on the shed blood of Christ and based on our faith in Him. The law was not given to make us right with God, but to amplify our conscience and to point at us good and evil, which can only strengthen sin and condemn us further. Romans 3 verses 19 to 20 tell, uh, says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 19 here describes the purpose of the law, that the law was given to stop all excuses of man and that the whole world may become guilty before God. Today people would say, oh yeah, I've done, I have done some wrongs, but I was raised in an abusive family. I was taken advantage of when I was a child. 
Therefore, we blame it on anybody and anything else. The law does not give any allowances for why you did what you did. If you broke the standard, you are guilty. The law does not have any mercy in it. It stopped all your excuses and made you guilty before God. The law gave you both the knowledge of sin and the awareness of sin in your life. The law gave you a sin consciousness. This means that the law made you aware continuously of your sinful nature. However, in the New Testament, we have something better than the conscience. We as believers are not supposed to relate to God based on a list of do's and don'ts and based on whether we measure up to those rules or not. If we allow the law and the conscience to condemn us, we will continue to be entrapped in a vicious sinning cycle. Yes, it's true that the nature of our spirit, the core of our being, is no longer sinful. We no longer have that predisposition towards evil in us anymore at the level of our spirit. And because of that, when we come in contact with the law, it should not strengthen sin in us any longer as it did in the past, right? But between the law and our new reborn spirit is the soul with the mind that has, has been programmed according to the sinful spirit that we had before. Our habits, beliefs, and emotions have been ingrained with a consciousness of sin. And because of that, when the soul comes in contact with the law, not our reborn spirit, but the soul, it still makes us sin until we manage to renew our minds with an awareness of righteousness, with an awareness of our changed nature. Moreover, we as Christians still live in a fallen world, you know, right? And still have a conscience that constantly has a natural tendency towards the sin consciousness and towards living under the law. However, the truth is, is, now, is that now our new spirit is aligned and in unity with the law. There's no conflict between them anymore. Only the mind is the one that needs to catch up and align itself with what has happened in the inside of us. In the following session, we will touch a little bit on the consciousness of sins and of dead works. But until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you in His favor and grace. Amen. <music>